Ave Maria Purissima, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The commemoration is for St. Telesphorus, a pope. We mentioned him the other day when we were talking about knowing the date of Christmas. St. Telesphorus in the early second century is the one that decreed there should be three masses held on Christmas Day. Midnight Mass, Mass at Dawn, and Mass of the Day. So it goes all the way back to St. Telesphorus, who, like all the popes for the first three centuries, are martyrs, because that was the thanks he got for being the Bishop of Rome. It's also the feast of St. John Neumann, all you people from Pennsylvania, a special uh, point of pride, but an American saint there, he's in Philadelphia at St. Peter's Church. Uh, if you ever get a chance to go there, it's a rough part of town, so you'd want to have your, your car locked. Uh, but he's, when you, if you go in there, he's under the altar. Uh, I haven't been there. I, when I was in seminary, we'd get one day off every year, and so I'd drive down. He had just about enough time to drive down and spend about a half hour, 40 minutes, and then we'd have to get back but I'd go down there, so you can blame him in, in large part for the fact that I'm standing up here and not out in the pews because uh, he definitely got me through seminary. I was talking to the rector there uh, at one point in time, an old, uh, an old redemptorist who he, he was telling me that uh, it, was a, it was a grocery case or something they had him in or a, a, a department store case and so the, it was open air, and they had it sealed and all that. They had him at that time in the wrong vestments because they had him in new vestments, which isn't actually what he would have worn. He would the, he would have worn the, the pontifical vestments proper to things like from the council and before. And so he said the next time they open it up, they would they would change him, which I assume by this time had happened. But he did tell me that he knew the undertaker that in the in the 60s the Holy See asked. When he got exhumed, I think it was the 60s, but whenever, whatever, whatever the case may be, they exhumed and the Holy See asked for some relics to be sent. And uh, when they did his body, it was, was, was fine. And he cut him out and he took out a couple vertebrae and he, so he could see he had some kind of liver problem or something, so his liver was still fine. He was just put in the ground in 1860 and 100 years later was still in good condition. And he said at least at that time, he was a really tiny little guy, so the gloves were actually stuffed with cotton. His hands were up the sleeves a little bit like that, and they had gloves laying out there. And the same, you could see where his feet were because they had the, the little bus, these little uh, kind of boots that a bishop wears, but his feet were actually under the, this, this long uh, Gothic chasuble that they had on him. Anyway, amazing saint, lots of, lots of miracles with him. I'll mention a couple of those and then make a remark about First Friday. But at the time, uh, coming from Montana, I didn't know that you could actually get a hold of a relic. I thought they were in, in altars and so forth. And when I found out you could get a relic, it just blew me away in, in St. John Neumann. And so I, uh, I had uh, someone contacted me. Uh, they had just been to, from out in, the, in central Montana there, and they'd been to the doctor. They're, she's pregnant. She's older. they be about like eighth pregnancy or so. And uh, they said there was going to be some kind of birth defect and they, they could come back for amniocentesis or something. She says, we're not going to do anything like that. I can't remember what it was. I think it was, uh, I, I could call her up, but I, I'm pretty sure th that the child had, uh, had water on the brain. I can't remember the technical term right now. Anyway, so they asked to pray and I said, well, we'll do better than that. We'll pray, but we'll send them a relic. So we sent them a relic. They set that on her belly uh, every day for nine days, set a novena, and that child is, well, is now a grown woman and perfectly healthy. So then there was another one where they had, I remember this, it was Dandy Walker syndrome, which is a brain cyst where it's a developmental problem in, in, in utero where the brain isn't gonna develop. And then when they get out, they have to put a shunt in because the head will just swell up because they have to sh put a shunt to make sure the fluid will drain and all that. And uh, so when they called me up, I just sent them the relic, put it on, and it was in a research, it was the hospital where they had like the world experts on Danny Walker syndrome, so this wasn't a random uh, diagnosis. And they prayed that, that uh, uh, she's a nice young woman, now that's my niece. My brother's a physician and that's my niece, and she's perfectly healthy, a nice young woman. At that point in time, then uh, my, br my brother's father-in-law, who was a Jewish physician, contacted me to borrow the relic because he had a partner uh, where the wife uh, of, of his partner was uh, was in terminal cancer. She had like literally weeks to live. And she, it, this was like, I think, a February. And uh, I have the letter, but I don't, don't know where it is right now. 
and she wanted to live to May to see her son graduate from high school. So he, this Jewish guy asked me if I, he could borrow the relic. So I sent him the relic of St. John Neumann. Well, she saw her son graduate from college and, and lived a couple more years. And so he wrote a letter to me, the, the physician, and said he's never seen anything like that. She was without pain for the, whatever the six years or whatever. She went into remission, and, and uh, it was obviously the hand of God. I no longer have that relic, uh, but uh, you can pray to him because he's very powerful. Anyways, that's a little bit about St. John Norman uh, over in Philly. First Friday, we want to make communions of reparation. We're making communions of reparation, which is a good communion, where we invite our Lord into a heart that loves him. We make reparation for all the people that don't, for all the blasphemies against him, for all the sacrileges, especially all these sacrilegious communions. So many people just thoughtlessly go to communion. They haven't gone to confession. You can go to these big parishes. Everybody goes to communion. And when I was a layman, there'd be about the same six of us every Saturday morning when you had the 20 minutes of confession in line. What's all that about? You know there's a lot of bad communions being made. We have to make reparation for them. And now we have to make even more reparation because as an official policy... It certainly isn't the teaching of the church, but as an official policy, the Pope is insisting that communion be sacrificially given to people who are shacked up. That's the state of the church today. We have to pray. We have to make reparation to our Lord, who's done nothing but love us and showed his love for us by dying for us on the cross, remaining with us, the most blessed sacrament of the altar.